Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. As always, I'm Dr. Klip Sapurski, the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. Today with me is Saeed El Qadari, the Senior Vice President of Professional Dining of Ellier North America. We'll talk about what Ellier North America is and does. But first, let's talk a little bit about corporate dining, how that industry recovered from the pandemic, and what you see as happening with most companies shifting to a hybrid work model in the corporate dining industry. Well, Glenn, we um, we probably need to go to pre-pandemic and talk okay. about how it used to be, um, and then move forward to today, because sure. the industry is is very different today um, mm. from what it used to be. Um, from my perspective, my business, it used to be 50% or 60% of my business was on a P&L basis. So we go, we provide the, 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 the services, uh, the employees will purchase our uh, product and we make money or we don't. The other 40% was fee-based type of management fee. Um, during the pandemic, we had so many different reactions from different industries and different type of clients. There are those who decided they're gonna shut down completely. Mm -hmm. um, so we put the contract on hold. There are those who decided to go from a full cafe with four different stations into um, a one-man show, just one person showing up and serving. And there are those who decided to shut down the cafe and turn into grab and go mini markets type of scenario. Um, but there are also those who decided they want to keep it on 100% and turn it into an amenity for their employees. Hmm. When it used to be um, either uh, full, the employee pays and the company have no involvement in the scenario, to some of the companies that the employee would pay a subsidized amount mm -hmm. and they would pay the rest to suddenly the company pays a hundred percent of the subsidy. Mm -hmm. It's um, and it became an amenity, an attraction to get the employees to come back to work. Um, we at the same time switched our model. And if you look at my business currently, you will see that 95% of my business is uh, subsidized and fee mm. management business, and five percent is PNL. Um, and 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 I, you know, Glenn, one can tell you that what this was was a miracle to do, but hmm. honestly, it wasn't. A lot of those who decided to stay open and to stay connected and to stay offering something to their employees um, were very understanding. They were mm -hmm. very. Um, um, appreciative to the fact that we actually stayed and provided them with the service. Um, mm -hmm. And we're talking switching from a full cafe to a mini market was grab and go. They requested on Friday and were Monday up and running. Nice. So while everybody else was in the market was um, laying off people, we were actually hiring people mm -hmm. and maintaining our people. Mm -hmm. um, Right now, as we speak, we are going through another revolution of change. Uh, larger customers who were doing 100% subsidized free program are mm -hmm. now switching back to employees sure. paying a portion um, and they are offering some portion and they're being creative. Um, I have a customer that, that is now making their employee pay 100% of their food but they're offering them coffee and beverages free attached to it. Now, if you look at the, the from that perspective to see, did it really impact anything? Did it impact the attendance of people coming to the office or not? Mm -hmm. From what we tracked, it really didn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. A free program did not make the difference because a free program now, <laughs> You've been in the business for a while and you will remember this. It used to be that an employee is looking for a, um, a good health insurance. 
And then they started looking for having a gym in the office, mm -hmm. um, childcare. And yeah. then they started looking at having some kind of a food perspective in that office. Um, today, they're expecting all of the bag, all of this, plus the flexibility of them being able to wake up one morning and say, I'm going to work from home today mm -hmm. and don't have to go to their boss and talk about it. So from our perspective as, as, as um, the corporate dining and the people that provides the unknown of how many people are going to show up to work today sure. um, has made it for us a nightmare. Mm. Um, but we have a great mechanism where we are continuously tracking and tracking and tracking and getting better um, so that we continue to be afloat um, and give our company what they're looking for from profitability and customer mm -hmm. satisfaction. And at the same time, dealing with the waves of the up and down every mm -hmm. day. Um, I have to say some of the customers did us a favor uh, by saying, okay, um, you can stay at home Monday and Friday, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you're in the office. And some gave them the liberal of, you can come one day in the office and regardless right. what that day is. So if that tells you anything. <laughs> That's definitely more complex for you. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear that. So I've helped by now 22 companies transition to hybrid and remote work. And how we've been using corporate dining is mainly as a social tool. So the companies I work with generally choose a more flexible model because when we look at flexibility, that's definitely something that helps retain employees, keep them more productive. And I understand it makes your job harder, but that's just the reality of the situation in terms well, of flexibility able... being being really important for retention, productivity, engagement. But what how we're using corporate dining is as a way of gathering people together. So for example, if people, if there's a team that if they come in one day a week, what we do is we have each day, some days we have something like lunches. So for example, one of my clients who allowed me to talk about their work, Information Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California. On Monday and Tuesday, we organize every afternoon at three o'clock, uh, cookies and fruit and coffee hour, sort of speak. So that sort of activity. And then people who want to come in those days know that, hey, if we come in around 3 p.m., if we come in earlier and stay until 3 p.m., we'll get some social time with people. And if we come in around 3 p.m. and stay later, we'll get some social time with people. So flexibility for Tuesday, for, for Wednesday and Thursday, for Wednesday we do lunch, and for and Thursday we do lunch both days. Then for Thursday we also do a leadership lunch. So all oh, I'm sorry, leadership breakfast. So all leaders get together for breakfast. So that, again, so people know they can come in and have that time. Because the problem we've discovered why we started doing this is that people were coming to the office, but other people weren't coming. So kind of the point of coming to the office, they felt lonely. They felt that they were missing other people. So we're using the corporate dining solution as an anchor where, okay, people can, can know, they'll come in, they'll see other people there, and they can socialize. So using the food as a magnet, as an attractor. I'm curious if you've seen other folks do something like that or in general, other word terms, when there's a flexible hybrid schedule, do you see food being an anchor point around which people revolve socially? Absolutely. You are absolutely right, and you're right on the money. We There is a lot of them that actually, actually on top of that, I mean, you're saying cookies and milk. Um, some companies started introducing alcohol. Hmm. So um, you will see that on a specific day of the week, which is with the tracking mechanism they have is the, the lowest in the, in the attendance type of scenario, they introduce mm -hmm. a happy hour. And mm -hmm. they say that if you come to the office that day, uh, starting after four o'clock, we will have a happy hour. Um, they started, uh, they started remodeling their cafes and their, and their, their food areas into destinations. So, mm -hmm. um, if you want to be able to watch the game or you want to do this, you can gather all of you together in that area. So 
they broke it down into destinations. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's really helpful. I could imagine that. Yeah, and other companies are doing these sort of happy hours. They're usually doing them off campus. So you're talk, you're saying that there are some companies that are doing it on campus. Yes, okay. indeed. I had to and go so, get a couple of liquor licenses. <laughs> ah, okay. No, yeah, because that's what I was thinking, but that's, that's difficult. <laughs> okay, cool. I'm glad that it's working out. Now, in terms of, let's talk a little bit more about hybrid work. There are more and more companies getting their employees to the office. And one of the challenges that, happen, that companies have been facing that I've had to help companies realize is that, hey, if you want to improve retention, one of the things you need to do is address people's pain points when they're coming to the office. You know, so people have nice, healthy food at home that they enjoy cooking. And previously, if you come to the office and you didn't have amenities like corporate dining, you know, you'd go out and get a sad office salad or you know some goldfish crackers or something like that to snack on. I'm curious what you found companies are offering in terms of snacks and immediately, shortly after getting their employees back to the office, snacks and food, what they're doing in that you know three month window to deal help you know, their employees deal with the pain of coming to the office. So um Part of the Elior North America program, we have the Be Well program. And the Be Well program is obviously um, a very healthy, addressing all allergens that's in place, uh, whether it's the gluten-free, whether it's uh, all of the above. Um, and we found that some companies would come to us and say, if somebody orders the Be Well, give them an incentive of X. So they're incenting their people to order the healthier stuff. Nice. Um, some others, um, the pantry program and the snacks um, went from being uh, the potato chips and uh, um, the heavy stuff into a much lighter snacks, mm -hmm. much lighter like nuts, like pistachios, nice. like, you know, healthier. As, as a, we went from having sodas and um um into the, the 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 most of the beverage companies now have some great salsa salsa water type of scenario um so having these um so a be well program we have a company a, an insurance company that actually in um incent their people and if you if it's available and you choose something else they actually penalize them with points. <laughs> oh, so you had a well uh, program and you chose to go that route. No, no, no. <laughs> Fair but yet we tell them that should we stop the other stuff? No, you got to keep it on. <laughs> Understood. Yeah, people make choices. Yes, so tell so. me a little bit more about LER North America, what it does, just what kind of services it provides. Clearly, you have a lot of expertise in this field. So Elliot North America is uh, one of the largest um, food service company. We exist in five different countries. We are actually, our mothership is uh, with our company is French. Um, that's where our main head office exists. But we are in, in Italy. We are in UK. Um, we are in Spain. We are in India. And we are in the United States of America. Um, just like our sister companies, we have segmentation. So myself, I run the business and industry, two companies. Um, we have in total 12 companies um, under the umbrella of all Elior North America, um, servicing whether it's education, K through 12, yeah. whether it's higher education, whether it's senior living, whether it's hospitals and healthcare, uh, prisons, um, uh, corporate catering and cultural and attraction areas, um, plus my business, which is the corporate dining. Um, mm -hmm. We uh, we say uh, that we are small enough to care, but large enough to make the difference. Mm -hmm. um, like I told you earlier, during the COVID, as everybody was laying mm -hmm. off everybody, we were actually hiring people on. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew yeah. that the way we're going to be serving is going to be different and it would require a lot more resources. We yeah. knew that uh, as we start coming into norm and reopening, it would require a lot of changes and so forth. So 
we didn't want to shortchange our customers. Um, and, and they felt it. Um, 95% of our customers pre-COVID are back with us now. Oh, um, and those, the 5% are 5% that we chose not to go back with. Um, mm -hmm. So um, we're very, very exciting about what's happening. We know it's challenging, but it's the way of life. And we have to, mm. um, we have to educate ourselves and educate the people around us on how to do, how to deal with your mm -hmm. new, new stuff. That, that's good words to conclude. Any other words, any last words that you want to share with our audience before we wrap up? Um, just hang in there. And, <laughs> um, and we are always there for you if you need us. Um, we, uh, and um, yeah, that's all I have for you. <laughs> thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming on the show, Say That was very helpful. Thank you so much. And thank you to the listeners for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Make sure to leave a review wherever you check this out. It really helps other folks discover the show and helps us improve the show based on your feedback. And please make sure to subscribe wherever you check this out on Apple, iTunes, on YouTube, wherever. All right, everyone. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. In the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends.